Okay, so um, we're going to get started. Um, so welcome everyone. It's so nice to see so many people here um, for our very last Paleo Paleoplex seminar of 2020. Um, so our speaker today um, is Ms. Saibo Raja um, from the University of Erlangen um, in Germany. Um, and her talk is entitled The Dirty Truth, Scientific um, Colonialism in Paleontology. So um, the format of today's seminar, um, so we have welcome and announcements for about five minutes, followed um, by the talk for about half an hour, um, a moderated Q&A, um, and then after talk, tea time with our speaker for about half an hour. Um, don't forget to send all your questions via the chat to the questions at Paleoperks host, who today is Chrissy. Um, and we now have a bit of housekeeping. Um, so we value the participation of everyone interested in the paleo sciences. Um, please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. Um, if you somehow found yourself here without signing this, um, please go to our website um, and take a moment to review that um, and sign it as well. Um, you should be muted already, um, but please remember to mute yourself for the duration of the talk. And a reminder again, you can ask questions by chatting to our questions host. Um, any technical issues that you have should also go to our questions host as well. Um, we're also accepting nominations, including self-nominations for our potential speaker pool. Um, and the website is on the screen. We also have um, inbuilt closed captions put into our Zoom now, so you can use the CC button um, at the bottom of your screen to show or hide them. Um, we also have our um, weekly survey monkey for demographic info. It's anonymous, optional, and very much encouraged, and you will find this in the chat window shortly. Um, so now to introduce today's speaker. Um, so our speaker today um, is Nsaibo Raja. Um, she did her bachelor's in geography at King's College London in the UK, followed by a master's in physical geography at Ankara University in Turkey, followed by a master's in geosciences um, in Erlangen, and she is also currently a PhD candidate um, as well. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Nsaibo for her talk. Great. Um, so... Hey everyone, um, wait, I'm just gonna move you guys away. Perfect. So I am really thrilled to be here to talk about what I have been, oh, my light just moved, there we go. To talk about what I have been up to uh, these past couple of months. So in my day job as a PhD student, I research ancient reef crisis. And to do that, I basically use different databases where fossil data has been compiled. And it is when thinking about the different biases in my data that I realized that the human bias in the fossil data collection is very much evident. So together with Emma Dunn from the University of Birmingham, we kind of set out to understand and quantify this bias, which is basically what I'm presenting here. And this project just keeps growing. Um, it's getting a bit crazy. Um, so there is a lot of talk about decolonizing the geosciences, including um, in paleontology. So when we talk about colonialism in paleontology, what do we exactly mean? So scientific colonialism itself can be defined as the process where knowledge about a certain nation resides outside of that nation itself. So this can be due to the biases in the distribution of accumulation of knowledge during colonial times, when uh, one claims the right to access data from other countries, or when one exports data from one country to another to have it processed there. So by processed here, I mean studied, and then you have the publication process. So when it comes to paleontology, what does this really mean? The questions that we are asking here are, were specimens or paleontological finds taken in colonial contexts? What were the researchers or explorers' relationships with local communities then, and what are they now? Do we cooperate with researchers or communities from these regions today, and do we talk about the origins of our collections? So I'm going to try to answer some of these questions, or at least uh, start the discussion around them. So first, there is the colonial legacy of fossil collections that is very well known, um, actually. Um, natural history museums, as we know them, wouldn't exist without colonial period. So one example here that I'm using, because I'm based in Germany, is the Bar Brachiosaurus uh, specimen on display at the Natural History Museum in Berlin. Um, the skeleton was assembled from fossil individuals, free fossil individuals recovered by German paleontologists in the 1900s in what was known back then as German East Africa and is now Tanzania. So basically these fossils were acquired during German occupation of Tanzania 
And following the logic applied to other colonial period artifacts, the museum's retention of the fossils makes it complacent with the colonial agenda. So German paleontologists have traditionally gotten the credit for this discovery, but it was in fact local residents who knew the bones and used them in religious rites. Uh, and they guided the foreigners to find these fossils, but their contributions have completely been erased until about um, three years ago. Well, more than three years ago, actually, the there was a project by the Natural History Museum uh, in Berlin uh, to document the history of the Tendagru expedition, which is where these fossils were found. And this is when basically this information was uncovered. But instead of restituting the skeleton, the museum, after the project ended, was proposing a program whereby Berlin would help to train Tanzanian paleontologists and technical workers to explore the large uncharted sections of the Tendagru formation. Um, I don't have any more information of that, and I'm hoping to be able to reach out to the Berlin uh, Museum later. But here the question remains, why should the German Museum have the right to hold and display these fossils? Um, the Tanzanian government still plans to reclaim countless objects that are currently kept in German museums. And um, they really think it would be a good sign, for example, if this large dinosaur skeleton was to be repatriated to Tanzania. But this is not the only museum facing repatriation requests. Many others are. But the ongoing discussion regarding decolonizing natural history museums is becoming more and more popular, which shows hope actually that things might change in the future. Uh, what we were interested more is whether in post-colonial times anything has changed. You would hope so, right? Um, for this, we turn to a very popular database, which is used by many paleontology, including myself, to study global diversity. So that's the paleobiology database. So it is a compilation of fossil occurrences, uh, now at 1.5 million occurrences from different sources, which amounts to almost 48,000 publications. Um, it's quite a lot. So we decided to focus our efforts on the last three decades, so starting from 1990, which is about half of the database. And what we have been doing so far is um, analyzing the data that is already in there, but also extracting affiliations from these publications. Uh, so basically, these publications are being used as a proxy to find out which researchers are collecting the data and where they could be getting their funding from. So based on the paleobiology database, we see the, that most fossil collections are located in North America. So these are the light colored pixels here, um, Europe, and also a small portion comes from East Asia and pa the Pacific region. Um, these are basically regions that is used by the World Bank, which I adopted here. But when I'm talking about East Asia and Pacific, I mostly mean this is China, Japan, and Australia. Anything else um, actually have very low uh, number of fossil collections compared to the others. Uh, so we were very interested into how, uh, who carried out the research, right? So we focus on three regions. And the regions I chose was one that had a history of imperialism and two who were at the receiving end of this. And I really wanted to compare these different regions to see uh, what really was happening. So here, the rounded arrows actually show that fossils were collected from researchers from the same region, and uh, the straight arrows represent researchers from other regions. So in Europe, most fossil data in the last 30 years were collected from researchers from European institutions, with Western European institutions having a bigger share of the cake, um, unsurprisingly. It's a bit different in Africa. Uh, researchers from Europe and then together with Northern America are also the ones contributing the most to fossil data collection in African regions and there is a very very little contribution from African researchers. On the other hand in South America local researchers are the ones driving the fossil data collection. So this is just an overview of the different networks uh, when it comes to field work in paleontology and it kind of shows you where people tend to go uh, and who are these people. But I was also interested in looking at how this has changed over time. So still focusing on these three regions, I looked at whether these publications actually um, included any local researchers. I think many of you have already seen this on Twitter but uh, 
so we are still gathering data between 1993 and 2005. We have about 8,000 publications left to go, which is uh, quite a lot. <laughs> um, but I really doubt that we will see um, any change here. Maybe it will flatten a little bit. But basically what we see that the percentage of publication in African countries or regions that did not involve any local researchers remain quite high. But the interesting trend is that is that of South America here with, that has undergone uh, drastic change. Uh, I also look at first also publications and this is even worse. Uh, you can see that numbers have increased, but still um, that of South America uh, remains low. So before talking about why I think um, the South American region is so different, I want to quickly show the pattern for individual countries worldwide, because I don't think it's great to lump all of these countries together in one region. You do see differences across different regions. So there we go. The darker colors on the map shows the ones where local researchers are regularly either carrying out the work or are involved of the, on the publications. So you can already see that the high income countries tend to fare better than other countries. Um, there are some African countries that do have the involvement of local researchers. Um, so in my next slide, I'll show you what, how this changes when we look at first author publications. Uh, but the rest of Africa and Central Asia are the ones with the most evidence of parachute science, where foreign researchers are coming in, collecting the data, and then leaving. In South America, um, Argentina and Brazil are the main actors in the region. And as we can see here, this really changes when you look at first author publications. So again, you have this, uh, the dark colors for the high income countries where you see that they are the ones carrying out the work, but the rest of the world is pretty much um, like driven from the actions of the others. So from the publications in the paleo biology database, uh, we also look at the languages because linguistic discrimination is something that we find a lot in science and in paleontology as well. So 82 of them were in English and the next major languages were French and German and the remaining 10% make up 13 other languages. Um, English dominates the academic publishing world, so this dominance is really not surprising here. Um, also, when you look at the paleobiology database itself, the contributors tend to be in these high income countries, which a lot of them are English speaking or have a high um, English proficiency index. So this can and often does lead to the marginalization of researchers who are not first language uh, speakers of English and who would usually come from these emerging communities, economies, sorry. So the most sample countries are also part of the group of high income countries around the world, suggesting that income group is a factor affecting fossil uh, data collection in the world. And this classification also correlates with education level and access to research funding. So I'm um, not going to get into the details of this. So we actually did some quantitative modeling because some people won't accept our results. Uh, I feel if we don't have anything pure like scientific. Um, anyway, so our model shows that the gross domestic product, research funding, English language proficiency, together with geopolitical stability, were the drivers of fossil data collection. And when talking about geopolitical stability, this will become important a bit later. We can see that the root of much of the political instability around the world can be traced back to colonialism. Um, and can so in the future we are also planning to include imperialism history in our model to make it a bit more complete. But uh, back to the South American countries, why was that so? So it's basically due to fossil registration um, about uh, patrimony heritage that may actually have an influence in restricting access of exports of fossils to other countries, and the investment in uh, science funding as well promoted the contributions of local researchers in paleontological studies. So looking at these two countries, there are several laws and basically fossils and paleontological sites are the property of the states and they are protected by law. Foreign researchers must include a local specialist when conducting paleontological and geological research in the country. And fossils must stay in the country and be reposited in a national scientific institution or museum. Um, 
these legislations have actually been called draconian by some researchers who think that fossils should be allowed to flow freely from one country to another. Well, if only that would be reciprocal, right? So many countries actually have such legislations that tend to be, and these countries tend to be those that have experienced colonial plunder and have to resort to extreme measures to protect their country's heritage. Um, but what actually happens when a country has such laws, but these can be exploited? So I am going to talk about a very high profile case that Em and I have been investigating, and that is riddled with disagreements and controversies. Um, if you don't agree with my following slides, I'm really sorry. Um, so I'm going to focus a bit on Myanmar, a Southeast Asian country where important fossil primates have been found, but it's also more notorious for its Cretaceous amber, which offers a window in the lives of dinosaurs, among other organisms. So Myanmar amber is mostly mined in the northern state of Kachin in the Hukong Valley in Tanai. And they are then transported to be sold on the amber market of Midkina or to Tenchong in the Yunnan province of China, sometimes through some not so legal routes. Um, many fossils described in the literature can, uh, can probably be traced back to Tenchong where they were bought. Um, so Myanmar actually does have laws protecting fossils, but also those that allow the export of amber. Uh, I'm going to discuss the two of them, which have actually been revised in the last years. I think the first one in 2015 and the second one in 2019. Um, so the first one, which is the protection of antique objects law. So all fossils are actually considered to be antique objects. Fossils cannot be exported without specific permits. They cannot be sold. And knowingly searching for these objects without a permit is an offense, and all discoveries of these objects must be reported to the government. But then there's the gemstone law, which, uh, so basically since 1995, amber is considered to be a gemstone and is owned by the state. And the state does grant permits to remove, process, and marketize these gemstones, and exporting uh, this gemstone does require permits and authorization, but the goal of this law is basically to legalize the trade in gemstone to support it. Um, so why am I actually going into this? So just as an understanding from these two laws, exporting a fossil from Myanmar without a permit is against the law. Engaging in the market for these items is itself a crime. But excavating and exporting amber for the sake of making jewelry is not a crime. But if there were a fossil inside that amber, the fossil would be illegally exported. Uh, but there are times where people know that these fossils are in there, and these have then been brought out of Myanmar under the gemstone law to be used. So what happens then uh, is that the law is actually being exploited. And there are even reports that some scientists are getting insider information from those in charge of the mines when something uh, important may have been found and the value of amber inclusions um, might also be uh, like inflating the price of amber which is already um, quite expensive so aside from the legalities of things these mines are located in a conflict zone um, so there has been a conflict between the Myanmar National Military and the Kachin Independence Army for over 70 years since the independence from British rule. And both the army actually and the Kachin Independence Army are directly involved in the mining business through companies related to them and are collected unofficial transit duties during transportation of these December probably to China. And when you look at in terms of economy, um, the trade of amber, of legitimate amber, is estimated at 1 billion US dollars in any given year. So this is based on 2019 figures. A single spider inclusion can be sold for up to a thousand US dollars. And a preserved dinosaur tail, uh, which a lot of people know about, can bring up to a hundred thousand US dollars. So since the military takeover, so that was about two, in 2017, there have been regular attacks in the Tanai mining area, including aerial bombardment and heavy artillery, which have killed many civilians. 
Many people were driven away from their lands when the military took over the region and the mines. So miners have stayed because there is no other way to make a living. Um, the internally displaced people, this is a term that is used to refer to them, sometimes illegally mine amber because there isn't enough work for them and can be shot on sight by the military forces if found. And even legal workers have lost their lives when mines uh, flood or cave in. Uh, it is estimated that several are killed every month. And many of these workers actually tend to be teenagers because of how the small the shafts are. So they can, they are usually the only ones that can fit in there. And there are several alleged human rights violation abuses by the military and security forces in Kachin with several connections made to Amber according to UN reports. So how does this actually translate into what we see in our data? So this is basically the number of publications on amber fossils for the last 30 years. And you can see that it has increased a lot since then. So during the 1990s to about 2000, the mining was being conducted um, by a Canadian company. And actually any sort of violations around this time is practically unknown. So the mines, uh, uh, so things started really taking off in 2010. So this is about the time when Chinese amber mines tapped out. And this is when the increase in Myanmar amber production increased. And this is about the time when the military started taking over the mines, but they were not very successful at first. And the mines were still uh, under the control of the Kachin Independent Army for a couple of years um, from 2010. 2010 to about um, 2017. So in 2015, the antiquity law was amended to ban the export of fossils. But then 2016 really is when things started to change, when the first dinosaur tail with preserved features, or with preserved feathers, sorry, were found. And at the same time, we also see an increase in Google searches uh, regarding me and Amber. So it is believed that this discovery and future ones have and will fuel interest from many, include, from many people, including gem dealers, miners, amber hunters, and jewelers. Um, just a couple of months later, the military seized complete control of the mines, uh, which some reports have directly linked to the finding of the dinosaur specimen and what they used as a reason was concerns for environmental conservation and the risk of losing state revenue. And then in 2019, there was the Science Magazine article exposing the provenance of Myanmar fossils. And then a similar article uh, this year uh, in the New York Times on the concerns of certain paleontologists over Myanmar fossil research. And around that time was when also the occluded Tavis specimen was described in nature. This was a very rushed publication. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know about it. So in April, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology published a letter to journal editors regarding the ethics and reproducibility of research on amber. And they actually set a threshold of 2017 after which um, specimens collected after which uh, should not be uh, research on or even collected. So later this year, the Nature Paper was retracted. And there was also a reply to the SVP letter by other paleontologists who very much disagreed with the letter. But there was one thing that I found good in it was that they recommended a wider discussion with the paleontological community to set ethical standards for journal. So based on that, um, in November, so not very long ago, about two weeks ago, actually, the SVP uh, Myanmar Advisory Group uh, was officially formed, of which I am now the co-chair. So based on the data that we have, uh, we compared publications, again, um, that included research done on Myanmar fossils uh, found in amber and those that were not found in amber. Uh, based on the data that we have so far, None of these publications that focus on amber fossils included any local researchers. Some of those that were on non-amber materials did include local researchers, not to the extent that we would like them, but this still shows how uh, laws are being exploited in terms of the gemstone law and how other laws might be protecting uh, the fossils 
that all co collected in Myanmar. So we also looked at around 100 publications between 20, 2017 and 2020 for any statement on the provenance of the material and ethics of research around amber. Uh, basically, this is what Emma has been doing for the past few days. And from what we found, um, and I'm quoting her right now, well, kind of, it would be completely accurate to say that in the PBDB, there are more papers on Myanmar amber dedicated to Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones, which stands at a total of one, than papers on Myanmar amber that contain a dedicated ethics statement. So, sorry. So basically, there were none. Um, only one actually mentioned an export permit, which was available on the request, and two mentioned some sort of license. We reached out to the authors who, who had the permit available on request, and they sent us a copy of the permit. And according to the person who acquired the fossils, who was a private collector, he was the only one to have had the permit uh, in the year of 2017 in Europe and the UK, well, including the UK. So there is also the issue of who is funding research on Myanmar Amber. Most researchers get their funding from governmental organizations, which can also be observed in the data that we have from the Web of Science. So indirectly, this funding may be funding a conflict and all the human rights issues that come with it. So there are several conflicting reports regarding this. So this is something we're still looking into. And this is one of the reasons that the SEV is asking for a ban on research on amber collected after 2017. So one important thing about dinosaur found in amber is that they are very, very popular. So we also looked at the old metric scores of publication. Uh, the old metric score basically shows how much attention a publication has received on social media and in the news. So it's basically an alternative metric to, for example, the H index or citations. So we only focus on papers in nature and science because these are the elite journals in which such extraordinary discoveries are published. So we compared uh, paleontological publications, dividing them between those that had the term dinosaur in the title and those that did not, and publications on Myanmar amber only using the same um, division. So in general, you can see that dinosaur papers tend to receive more um, attention than non dinosaur papers. But this difference is even more when you look at um, Myanmar papers. So the public loves dinosaurs, right? They are absolutely fascinated by it. And the very fact that they are so popular could be feeding the frenzy around Myanmar amber, which offers us a window during the time that the dinosaurs live. And the exceptional preservation of these specimens mean that they are even more impressive. So um, this is also one of the reasons that many such impressive fossils um, not restricted to dinosaurs only end up in the hands of private collectors and are sold at outrageous uh, prices never to be researched again. So there is also one thing to think about. Just because paleontologists stop working on Myanmar amber does not mean that these issues around these fossils will disappear. So kind of reaching the end here. Um, so who actually benefits from scientific colonialism or rather who should actually be thinking uh, of scientific colonialism. Many do, many actually benefit from scientific colonialism. So it does not only fall on the shoulder of the scientists who has all the pressures of academia pushing them to do just science. Uh, just within the scientific community, funders and journal editors can already make a big difference and set ethical standards when conducting science. In the case of Myanmar Amber, or Myanmar itself is certainly not unique. There are several locations that can be linked to human rights abuses and other where laws are bent for the good of science. So really hoping that our future work will set standards on how to deal with such issues, but we are nowhere close to that. So I'm really sorry, I'm not offering any solutions here. Um, many people say that science and politics should not mix, but they already are very much intertwined. Um, true, science is, fundamentally meant to be universal, right? But we can see that the choices of fieldwork location of researchers from higher income countries have shaped the fossil occurrence distribution that we observe today. This can explain the high number of fossil sites in these income countries, 
the global sampling distribution as well. And in many cases where researchers from high income countries carry out field work in lower income countries, publications resulting from these endeavors show that very, very often no local researchers were involved. And this pattern, which extends to definitely more than just three decades that we focus on, has created a scientific hierarchy uh, where paleontological knowledge is held by the high income countries, especially in Europe and North America. But what we also see is that our choices of fieldwork also affects other parts of society, despite fossil being millions of years old and supposedly having no cultural connections, an argument that is often used against the decolonization process. So the first step to conducting research that is more ethical and democratic is to admit and acknowledge that there is this problem where knowledge in paleontology and across scientific disciplines is driven by power relations. Um, in a perfect world, science knows no political, cultural or racial discrimination, but as centuries of scientific colonialism reminds us, this isn't a perfect world, which is why we are doing the work that we are doing. So I'm going to leave it here, but if you want to keep us with the work that we are doing, uh, you can visit our freshly new website at paleoscientmetrics.github.io. Uh, feel free to get in touch if you have any comments, any ideas. If you want to contribute anything, basically, just tell me. Thank you. Thanks, Nassar, for a really, really awesome talk. Um, so uh, we are now opening up the floor for questions. So uh, remember to send your questions into the questions at Paleopex host um, in the chat. Um, so we have one question in. Um, do you know a positive example of decolonization of paleontological collections and what made it successful? I don't actually know. Um, do you know whoever actually asked the question? I would be very happy to know. Or anybody else, like. We've got some um, positive messages in the chat. Um, at the moment. Um, so we have another question through. Um, you talked a lot about the Myanmar Amber. Are there other examples of this type of paleontology mixing with conflict and human rights violations? Um, I don't know a lot of it, but what I was recently told, for example, is that there is a lot of work being done in Xinjiang in China, where um, the, it is a very big problem, where a lot of Uyghurs live. And this is basically where the Chinese government is basically oppressing the population. So there's a lot going on there. And um, yeah, so this would be one of the, the, the examples. But to be honest, I don't know a lot about it. I only started looking into this very recently. So hopefully next year, I'll have more to say about this. Great. Um, so we have another question. Um, do you think the local author time series are showing things are getting worse, not better? Um, actually, we do see a decrease in terms of um, how many how many are not being involved so basically we have more and more local researchers being in uh, being included in the research process um so i think it's getting better uh but very slowly but at the same time i worry whether um this shows not the actual involvement of researchers but some sort of postal science where the local authors are kind of uh, collecting the data and shipping it off to these uh, like richer institutions um, to where the science is actually done and they are not included on this. But to be honest, I have no way to say whether this is actually true or not. Um, so we have another question through. Uh, Myanmar is independent 
1948 and Tanzania since 1964. How much money do these countries spend on paleontological research? How many paleontologists are working in these countries funded by the government? Um, so I don't actually know how many is how much money is spent on paleontological research. It is quite hard to find this sort of information. But in terms of research funding itself, uh, you can see that these um, these countries tend to have um, lesser amounts in terms of research funding as compared to more richer countries, which does make sense. And I'm guessing that there are other priorities than paleontology. So I would say not a lot, but are there any incentives actually from the government to uh, carry out research? This is what we have to ask and how can we actually make these make this happen? So we know how to do scientific outreach right? To in the Western world. So can this be done in countries where these uh, specimens are actually found and whether uh, this would actually be welcomed by the committee is something that we should be asking. Um, so I have another question. Um, can you explain a bit more about how people can get involved? Um, well, we do need a lot of people for data collection, <laughs> but um, if you have basically any ideas or, or, so I'm very new to paleontology. This is something that uh, a lot of people know about. So I only got into paleontology like two, three years ago. Before that, I was um, in conservation. So I'm basically applying the same things that I have here. And I don't actually do field work. So um, I'm basically this person who sits at their computer. So if you have field work experience and you actually know about these issues, it would be very valuable to us to actually know what stands behind the data because right now I have numbers, but to actually explain these numbers are actually really, really hard when you're not actually the one who has done field work and know actually what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so we have Another question, um, let's say a journal receives a paper submission on exciting fossils and it includes numerous authors but no local authors in a developing country of the fossil's origin. Aside from querying authors, why are there no local co-authors, which is a bit toothless? What is best to do? Projecting out of hand might not be ideal. I don't know. <laughs> So very, very hard questions here. Um, to be honest, it's basically about asking questions, right? About why are there no local co-authors? How did you actually get these fossils? Did you just go there? Um, and I think these things should be made public as well. Um, it's basically, I don't, I don't want to public shame people, but... Um, people have to understand that we cannot continue doing what we have been doing. And uh, if you increase, so basically what I think that should be done is basically include these things in the curriculum when we are training new paleontologists to actually like think about ethics, about doing field work so that the next generation doesn't actually carry out the way like the past generations have been doing. Um, maybe this is not the ideal way and I don't know a lot about publishing to say that what should be done, but yeah. So we have another one through. Um, great talk. Um, the Brazil Museum Fire is often cited as an event which counts against returning fossil collections to their country of origin. How can we balance the ethical importance of doing this with ensuring these museums are funded and the fossils properly looked after? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Um, so great talk. Um, the Brazil Museum Fire is often cited as an event which counts against returning fossil collections to their country of origin. How can we balance the ethical importance of doing this with ensuring these museums are funded and the fossils properly looked after? Well, um, one thing that I have been thinking about is when we think, th when we are thinking about repatriations of fossils, right? 
um, it doesn't have to be everything goes. Why can't we have like a circulation of, for example, fossils in different countries, but also the different uh, other countries that do not have, you know, like I can go to Berlin and see this amazing specimen, but why can't we just move it around? Uh, I know this costs a lot of money, but like if you talk about like a circulation of fossils between different countries, between if you have agreements different between different museums and everyone actually has opportunities to see these things. And uh, maybe you have, you know, a vault somewhere, I don't know where we can have um, these, um, these like specimens or digitalization of collections, all of that have I think like all of that are things that we should be thinking about. And as I said, it's like, it's not a one person job. It's not just a job of the scientists. It's basically everything and everyone. Um, so we have one other question. Um, do you agree that not enough funding of paleontology results in the total loss of fossils as they are mined and not recognized? Um, can you repeat that? Or is it in the chat? I'm sorry, I really don't hear you properly. <laughs> well, uh, I'll just drop it home. Um, yeah. yeah, I just dropped it in the chat. Yes, I mean, I was reading today about um, are private collectors right and they tend to have well some of them tend to have money some of them not so much but uh, you actually see that some uh, of specimens that have been dug out by private collectors for example would have just been eroded on the side if um, they were not there so i'm thinking there is actually not enough funding uh, of paleontology and this is basically resulting uh, in the loss of fossils in general so not just in myanmar amber and also, if you have amber, for example, this goes like from hands to hands, right? It goes from the miner to actually the person dealing with it to actually other people or the scientists. So these traders, they're not really um, trained to detect whether there's something interesting in there or not. So if they can't figure out whether this is actually really valuable, it's just like some weird thing in there. I mean, I think that they are going to probably end up in hands that um, do not know anything about fossils or just interested in the jewelry made from that amber and will probably be lost. So you have another question through. Um, do you know <laughs> if any funding bodies recognize this problem and consider the ethics of the samples used when giving research money? As far as I know, no. And we have another one. Um, can you explain a bit more about what form the data takes? Is this based on author addresses on publications? So basically on every journal uh, publication, um, you have the institution or the affiliation, and this is what we have been extracting. So it does not reflect the actual nationality of the person. And uh, really, I have no way of doing that for 28,000 publications. Uh, so this is like the best proxy that we have uh, at this point. And so we have one more. Um, in papers that don't have co-authors from the origin countries, do you know anything about whether people from the origin countries are included in the acknowledgements? So actually, no, I haven't looked into this. So we only started looking in the acknowledgements very recently, just for Myanmar Ember. And I know that so far we have not found anything other than the uh, dedication to Mick Jagger. Uh, that was the most interesting thing that came up, uh, but nothing uh, actually said anything about uh, including people from the origin country. So it would be really interesting to have a look at this, but uh, this is, a, again, quite some hard work. So um, we might have to leave that for the future. We have one final one. Uh, what are the implications of your research for large databases like the paleobiology database 
Are there issues of scientific colonialism around using this data, as well as the use of specimens and paper authorship? I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that, first of all, we should all be aware of where this data is coming from and uh, how we use this data is very important. And uh, I'm already working on a way, for example, to acknowledge the different publications in the paleobiology database itself. So whether or not they were by people of local researchers, because I feel like a lot of people have this, I mean, people who do not know, uh, um, who do not use this data or are against this data, they're like, okay, I collected this data, but I do not get any recognition for it. So I'm actually working on a way to do that. Um, so hopefully that's one step forward, but I don't think it's like the right way. And really, I don't know how to go about even thinking about this. So any other ideas would be very welcome. Okay, so we don't have any more questions. Um, oh, thank God. <laughs> There were loads of them, um, but all really great. Um, okay, so um, so thank you again for your really, really awesome talk. Um, I'm going to take over the screen share. Yeah. Just do the closing out part. Um, Okay, so thank you very much everyone for joining us for our final of 2020. Um, please remember to fill out the survey monkey so the link will be in the chat very shortly um, so we can learn a bit more about who attended today. Um, we hope you have a really, really awesome rest of December. We're taking a very short break um, until early January. Um, and so we hope to see you then. Um, so up next, we have um, our small group discussions. Um, so why join, um, learn more about today's speaker, their research path and the work that they do, um, meet some new paleo friends or bump into old ones, um, and discuss the talk with paleo fans with different backgrounds and just have a short chat before heading back to a regularly scheduled day. Um, so we're gonna have a quick break before tea time um, and we have a timer. Um, so feel free to get up, walk around, have a drink of water and come back in two minutes. 